Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Veg Networking Canada, a community where vegan plant-based companies connect and collaborate. It's important to honor, acknowledge, and respect that many of us are located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples of Canada. Today, our special guest has a thirst for adventure and an eye for beauty. She's a champion for combining her passion for creativity and entrepreneurship with circular economy solutions. And she is a believer in the power of conscious consumerism and clean tech. Veg Networking Canada is pleased to introduce the co-founder of Myco Futures. Welcome, Stephanie Lip. Hello. Glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. So first question, we always talk about, you know, Veg Networking Canada is a group based around sort of the, the vegan plant-based ecosystem. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that means to you? Yes, I think um, ever since getting into fungi, mushrooms, I've learned a lot about how uh, taking the example of plants and especially fungi um, is really important on how we can model so many other systems, capitalism, consumption, fashion, food. Um, and while that's not immediately apparent how that connects back to, uh, you know, to vegan um, ideas, I think um so as someone who's not a vegan myself and who does strive to reduce my consumption of everything, especially animal products, I can't, haven't quite managed to do it fully, but um, I think it's uh, really great to see that this, the business that I'm doing right now wouldn't exist if there wasn't that strong drive to have better solutions, more ethical, more compassionate solutions. Um, and that I don't think you have to be vegan to appreciate the need for that, to take care of our, our planet, to take care of each other and to um, really have hope for a healthier future. And I think that, um, you know, as veganism becomes more mainstream, hopefully, um, and more effective, uh, those are those are things that will make what I'm trying to do easier to come to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Again, it's a it's a community that we have here where um, not everybody listening um, might identify as you know vegan or plant based or whatever that might be, right? And so, to your point, it's it's important to um, be part of communities and surround yourself with people who are trying to make the planet a better place, right? And that means different things to different people on different journeys and all of that. And so, we're thrilled to have you here. So let's talk business. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. How did uh, your entrepreneur spark or spirit begin? Um, that, I mean, looking back at, you know, my life, I didn't, I thought this was something kind of on the new side, but I think for a very, very long time since I was little, I've always loved the idea of having something that other people liked and that I could, you know, make them happy by them, you know, having it or taking part in it. And one of my earliest memories is visiting family in the Philippines and my aunt had a little cafeteria and there'd be students and like neighborhood people that came. And I just loved, you know, taking people's lunch orders and um, just, you know, seeing the orders come in. I they, they sold cigarettes by the stick. And I just thought it was really fun to be able to talk to people, make them happy um, and have this like bustle of activity. Um, it wasn't really so much about any consciousness of, you know, commerce or money. It was just the fact that um, we were part of a community, making people happy with what we had. And later on um, in high school, I was, I went to an arts high school. So it was a very creative environment. And I, you know, remember being part of the fashion committee and buying things at thrift stores and cutting them up and putting them back together, which wasn't as common back then. I made earrings out of photography lab filters. And so I've always just wanted to be creative, make something and then share it with other people because otherwise <laughs> my house would be just full of things. But I've always just had a passion for, for sharing my creativity with other people who appreciate it. And I think that's where it started. Interesting. Now, in terms of where it started, that's very cool. That was early on for you. But what about now? Where, like, tell us more about Michael Futures, um, where you're at. Where, how that started, where you're at today. And then the next question for you is, where is your business going in the future? So you can kind of walk us through the evolution of Michael Futures and tell us what's next. Sure. So again, looking back, I think it was almost an accident, but at the same time, a lot of things throughout my life came together to make this possible. Um, so I'm originally from Mississauga, Ontario, where I was born and raised. And um, 
my co-founder, who's also my partner, and I were looking for a new adventure outside of Ontario with rising costs. And we just, you know, thought that um, there is still more out there to see and do. And my partner, Leo, he's from Newfoundland. And we quickly saw how inexpensive houses were there. And I literally Googled moving to Newfoundland, thinking someone had maybe made a blog of moving from the city to a smaller outport town and what that experience was. Um, and while I did not find that blog, I did find a bunch of articles about a town called Bonavista, which is on the east coast of the island on a peninsula jetting out into the North Atlantic Ocean with a population of around 4,000 people at best. But um, this particular place was experiencing kind of a renaissance after the Cod Moratorium of the 90s uh, really destroyed killed all the the commerce of the small outport towns that relied on the fishing industry. Um, but because of overfishing and overconsumption, they, they really had to shut it down for the sake of the you know fish population. Um, but this particular town was bouncing back after many years with young people moving there, lots of artists. Um, it was, was like pre-gentrification Brooklyn. It was, you know, a cool vibe. And so we could afford a house and we saw that we could be part of this vibrant growing community. Um, and we knew that to go there, we needed to contribute to this community. And so we we ran through a lot of ideas, but eventually landed on gourmet mushrooms um, because we learned that there was a lot of food insecurity in Newfoundland, especially in rural places where all the food is trucked in. And if there's any um, interruption to the ferry service, the island only has about 72 hours worth of food at any given time. Uh, which is, you know, pretty scary, especially you know, during the pandemic, thinking about how interrupted supply chains were. So this was an opportunity for us to create just a little bit of food. It, mushrooms wouldn't solve the whole food supply issue, but it was something that could be grown indoors year round. And we really created a concept around this to have a hub for nutrition, food culture, um, not only for the tourists that came there, but to really engage the local community to make them passionate about um, nutrition, about locally grown food and and how they could, you know, create um, you know, brighter, healthier plates for themselves and, and their kids. And we became really passionate about this. And then um, through our business development, we participated in a pre-accelerator um, because we needed something that was not just place-based, but something exportable. And that's how you get a lot of funding and, and support. Um, so we we're going to do uh, unique ferments and looking at nutraceuticals and health supplements from the mushrooms. Um, but it was around this time that a few things converge where it just kind of appeared, it started to seem that our big ideas were slightly too big for the small town and that um, a lot of these areas of the nutraceuticals and supplements were very, very crowded with a lot of barriers to get into these industries. Um, and so during this pre-accelerator, we pivoted into materials. Um, at first thinking that we couldn't possibly do this, it was way too complicated and you know, there was a, a couple other companies doing this, but uh, one of the entrepreneurs and residents we were talking about just told us to go for it, that competition was actually a good thing. And if we could figure out how to do it, um, you know, there was definitely a need. So we, we thought about it because it was a really big change. We thought we'd have a small business in a small place and a startup is something completely different that we didn't really know anything about. Um, but then one day, Leo had a mushroom grow bag that actually didn't grow any mushrooms. He thought it was a complete failure. It was just you know, a, a lump in a bag, basically. So we took it out and was going to spread it across our lawn as fertilizer. But as he rolled over it with our lawnmower, it broke the lawnmower because the mycelium that had grown in the substrate was so strong. Um, it was basically a rock. So it was kind of a eureka moment for Leo that we had a strain of fungi that demonstrated these mechanical properties of strength and resilience. And so um, within three months, um, in his spare time, he created our first postage stamp size prototype. And around that time, we, we won a pitch competition. So that gave us signs from the universe and a bit of confidence and a little bit of money to decide to pursue this. And so that was at the end of 2021. And so 2022 was basically learning what a startup was, talking to customers, figuring out how to make an idea into an actual business, um, which takes us to today. We're part of some really great international accelerators and incubators. Um, and we've created our first prototypes and these, you'll be some of the first people to see these. Um, I went to a small event last night, but basically we went from, uh, sheets that look like this, um, which, you know, are still in progress, but they have, um, strength, flexibility, and a really nice, um, hand feel, um, to creating this in July, which was our first kind of product that had a zipper and was made on a sewing machine. And just uh, last week, we were able to make this purse. So in the last few months, we've really um, 
evolved our product and we're really happy with this with this new prototype. And so um, with all of this progress, we are in our pre-seed fundraise to try to go from lab scale to bench scale, so or lab scale to room scale, so we can get samples to our LOI customers, um, continue to make prototypes, do lab-based testing, and within 18 months actually start selling products made with our material. Wow. Thank you for walking us through that. That's that's you know, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but I don't own purses, but that one looked really, really nice, the one that you just showed. <laughs> um, and uh, interesting story about the lawnmower breaking and, yeah. and finding out that way. That's, that's so interesting. Um, so in terms of mycelium and, um, you know, the circular economy, clean tech, biotech, the industry that you're in, what are some transformations or trends? Um, I think we're in a really great time to get into this. We're not at the beginning where you really had to convince people why circular economy and bio-based solutions were necessary. Um, but we're still at a time where it's not quite a given that you should fund these and support them. So we're 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 getting there. We see, you know, there's lots of impact funds, circular bioeconomy funds, business supports. Um, and there's lots of, and it's not just the materials. There's so many MEs. That's the one great thing about being um, a founder at this time and being in, involved in all the organizations we are. We get to meet so many other founders with just incredible ideas as well. And so we really see ours as like a sliver of a pie. All the other um, ideas and, and ventures are part of this pie. And we all need to make them happen to create this holistic plan for how we're going to kind of turn back the clock and what we've you know done to the the planet. So sometimes we're a bit like, overwrought with with panic over the environment but at the same time I actually get to meet the people um you know alongside ourselves that are doing so much work to to make it a reality that we will have a future planet in 50 years it's not going to be a a terrible like you know uh, apocalyptic scene um and so we don't have to explain why we need this but we still get very often we're too early. They want to see traction. I think there's still not quite the full understanding that there's understanding it's needed, but not the understanding that it's, it is a long um, R and D process that it's a little bit more risky than just the average SAS. And so we're, we're pushing through, but um, it's still, it's still challenging. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. Startups ain't easy. Uh, um, so in terms of giving back or charity, you might want to take this um, and answer it from a personal lens and or from a professional and company lens or both, right? So the question is like, what does giving back or charity actually mean to you? Oh, for us, I mean, we we look forward to the day we'll be, where we will be in the position where we can, you know, give back in, in all the ways we want to. Um, I think looking at our business as, as a whole is, um, a combination of environment, um, people, and innovation is really important. So when we are in the position to, you know, give back and, um, you know, align ourselves with the causes that matter to us, we want to find ways to support each of those things. So looking at the environment, how can we support all kinds of um, environmental causes, especially ones in, you know, places that don't have always have the privilege to have these uh, technologies that um, places where, you know, women and people, women of color are most adversely affected by climate change. We're really looking at that, um, looking at supporting women in leadership roles and in technology and um, supporting innovation from a young age. I know that I had a really privileged artistic upbringing where I felt like I could be really creative, but I didn't ever think that I could also be good at business and good at science. And so I think going forward, I'd really love to um, support initiatives that especially make girls feel that you don't have to choose, that you can you know, be good at all those three things. And actually a cause that's always been near and dear to myself and my family's heart is a shoebox project. Um, so uh, for the last few years, um, my family would have a shoebox filling day um, where you put little luxuries into a wrapped shoebox and these go to women living in shelters. And so um, this is across Canada and into North America where um, it's just a little something to make people living with homelessness or with housing insecurity uh, feel special during um, you know Christmas time, Mother's Day throughout the year. Yeah, it sounds like a nice like a uh, version of like a stocking, a stocking stuff. Yeah. And who doesn't love that? Um, yeah, worthwhile causes, absolutely. So in terms of business and entrepreneurship and your journey within it, 
Are there any resources that come to mind that you want to share that might benefit others in the form of so many different types, right? It might be books, podcasts, apps, websites, documentaries. Um, so, you know, whether you're going to answer that specifically from a business standpoint and or like helping the planet, are there any resources that you'd like to recommend? Um, one of the books I read very early on when I was really thinking about, because I, I, myself, like a lot of entrepreneurs have a lot of imposter syndrome. And one of the things that really helped was the book range by David Epstein, because, um, it, I mean, it, there, there's a polarizing, um, opinion with Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, but range is about how breadth, breadth of knowledge versus depth of knowledge, um, is really what makes, you know, successful, innovative and great um innovators um because I always thought that I'd done way too many things like work on a cruise ship I was a photographer I sold vintage like how could I possibly you know turn all of that and make it be a successful biotech clean tech co-founder but that book was pretty edifying to show that you learn so much from everything that you do and it's not always apparent um but it gets in in your head's deep down. And I, I really have come to learn that from all those different disparate seeming experiences, it's made me very well equipped to um, be as successful as I am today. And so I try to like tell anyone that it doesn't matter if you think you don't have any experience or it's so different, it's it's never too late to start again. And you have so much in you that will, will help you as long as you um, have the passion. And along those lines, um, I started l listening to the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Um, by Mark Manson. And one of the things that really resonated was uh, suffering is inevitable. You really have to choose a suffering that you can live with. And that really was an aha moment for me where sometimes I'm like, why did I do this? It's so hard. Like, you know, you think that startup life is so glamorous. You raise a couple million dollars, you're, but it's not like that at all. Um, but it, I wouldn't change it because this is really the suffering that I can live with and that I'm I'm proud to do because I really believe in in what the results are and what the purpose is. So um, I would definitely recommend go like that. There's a lot of profanity, but it gets a great point across that um, purpose isn't free from 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 suffering. But if you um, focus or if you're able to live with it then that will that's what's going to make you successful yeah the subtle art um most uh people who have have read that have essentially um come to the same sort of conclusion that you have and when it comes to range um back to your point right like transferable skills is real and part of i think realizing that is when you're doing something instead of feeling like you need to get out and do something else, just going like to your point, like kind of going through the hard or going through the suck, but realizing like you're, you're garnering transferable skills that to your point might be seemingly so different, but they, they will be applicable. And then, you know, you talked about like, choose your hard. Yeah. Like investing in yourself might be hard, but investing, not investing in yourself is also really hard. So it's like, choose which hard you want. Right. So Awesome. Awesome. That kind of almost falls into the wisdom tips, lessons, advice question for like the last one. But before we get there, we have uh, our second last one for you. And it's a really open ended question. We've had people answer that there's specific people or organizations or even like nature um, is, is an answer people have come up with. But the question is, what is inspiration to Stephanie Lip? What does it mean? How do you source it? pretty, pretty big open-ended question for you, but what does inspiration mean to you? That is a big question, especially as someone who's been a, you know, a creative and artist my whole life. I feel like everything is inspiring me. I'm so definitely an ideas person. It really hasn't been until this startup that I've really committed to executing. I've never been so committed to something before because I would get very distracted, but I want to do this. I want to do this. And um, I, I finally found something that can keep me focused um, just yeah, despite the suffering, despite the hardships. Um, so I guess one of the things is um, art. I just, I'm obsessed with it. I love it. I studied art history from a young, from high school onwards. And whether it's Egyptian art, creepy medieval babies, um, you know, contemporary pieces that I might not understand, even color field theory from the 70s that I hate and makes me angry. Um, I just really love seeing colors, textures, ideas made into something physical. Um, 
definitely love being by the ocean. Uh, living in Newfoundland taught me that there's a different kind of ocean. I was usually used to like Philippines, warm ocean, <laughs> living by so much water that I could not never swim in because it was so terrifyingly cold and seeing, you know, 50 meter waves in the winter, you know, gave me a different um, appreciation for that. But I just, I could listen to water and watch water all day. Um, and I guess as much as I take on too much, as much as I'm a yes person, I think I'm just inspired by being part of something. Um, I never really think of myself as like a joiner. I'm, I always feel like I'm a lone wolf, but I think I realize now that I do um, get invigor invigorated by being alongside other co-founders, alongside other environmentally conscious people, other women founders, and then um, being part of the solution. I think there's a lot of inspiration and um, energy that comes from that by knowing that no matter what happens, I tried, I won't have any regrets. And, you know, in the end, I hope I'll make a great impact out of it. Amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> Throughout the conversation so far, it's pretty clear that being part of that broad network of solutions-based folks definitely inspires you and, and keeps your uh, entrepreneurship uh, going and your spirit sparked. But we ha before we get to the last question, we actually have um, a question that came in from the chat. So hopefully that's okay with you. We'll kind of throw you a little bit of a curveball. And the question is, how can we support Myco Futures currently beside connections to investors? Because you're in your pre-seed. Question, are you looking for brands who would want to potentially use your material? Oh, yes, absolutely. We're We're still very, very... Um, open to working with brands on the early level. We have a couple of different options where um, if a brand is really dedicated to, you know, working with this early on, um, we have an LOI program that's a letter of intent saying that you're interested in working with us. If, you know, it meets your um, requirements, you'll, you'll buy it, but it's really that patient um, and collaborative work at the beginning, because there's certain brands that we've talked to that we wouldn't want to send them samples until it's a little bit more refined and perfect. But the person who made this, this was kind of a disaster. It kind of messed, made a mess on our sewing machine. But instead of being like, please never call me again. She was like, okay, give me your next one. And then it ended up turning into this and, you know, our next one will be even better than that. So having brands making interesting products and we'll test different tools and techniques, but also be patient with us and give us good feedback is, is super valuable. Um, and then there's other customers, you know, can tell us, you know, that we want samples later on when it's a bit more refined, but um, the more we can show demand, um, the, the easier it is with de um, investors and, and all that, because uh, even though it seems like a no brainer that of course people want animal free, toxic free, plastic free alternatives, <laughs> investors are just like, are you sure people want to buy this? I'm like, yes, I promise you people want to buy this. We just need the the capital to improve it, to get it to the point where, where people can use it. And because it's to do things without plastic, to do things without, you know, even, um, even though we're not vegan, we want it to be a totally vegan product. We don't want to exclude anyone. We don't use any animal based, um, oils or anything like that. And, um, and again, we think about even the wider effect on animals. We don't want it to um, contaminate water if there was ever, you know, some sort of leak from our, our um, from our processing. So we really want it to be safe for the people who make our product, who sew with it, and then who wear it. And, and that includes, you know, animals as well that come into contact with it. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Great. So last question a big open one to end in one again because you're going to be maybe speaking to people who are in these um incubators that you're talking about you might be speaking to them but you might also be speaking to someone who works a nine to five who has a burning passion but wants to you know follow that um so wide swath of folks that you might be speaking to and we've had guests that are very comfortable framing what they're about to say as you know this is advice that i'm imparting on you but other people frame it a little bit more like wisdom tips, lessons, things that have, you know, worked or challenged me that are worth kind of sharing with you. And so that's the question. It's centered around wisdom tips, lessons, or advice. Right. That's true. I definitely do not feel like I'm in a place to give people any advice because I'm still figuring it out. But um, I do still firmly, firmly believe that you need to live life without regret. So um and, and you don't have to do all or nothing. So if you, for example, as you said, if you work a nine to five job, but you have something that you're passionate about, you'll always find time for something that you love. So if you just spend, you know, even an hour a week for the six months, then, you know, starts 
getting getting more in your head or you make progress and you can spend five hours for the next six months and then eventually they become your full-time job. For us, we definitely did the more atomic version where we, uh, you know, quit our jobs, jumped in, um, you know, moved to another province to, to pursue what we um, wanted to do. And I definitely want to acknowledge there's a lot of privilege in that. Uh, to have a really supportive friends and family system who always come to our to help whether it's putting us up in their house um, you know giving us feedback you know listening to my tears because there's for me at least there's a lot of tears involved in, in having a startup and doing this um, but you know better out than in um, there's but I don't think I could ever say no matter what happens with our startup that I will regret doing it especially to the the amount of skills I've learned from doing this um, I think, you know, two years ago, the thought of talking like this to people would have terrified me, um, being able to just answer questions and hopefully sound smart. I don't think that was something I was terribly confident about. So putting yourself out th in your, putting yourself outside of your comfort zone, doing something that you, uh, you're passionate about, trying to make an impact, whether it's, um, you know, creating edible arrangements, if that's what you're passionate about, or if it's a new biotech material nothing is too small to not make a positive impact in someone else's life. You don't have to do something sweeping or complicated. If, if you love it, if it's bringing someone else joy, if you're doing it in an ethical way, if you're doing it in a thoughtful way, then I think you're making the world a better place and you can't regret that. I mean, always have a backup plan, do your homework, do your research. I mean, learn as much as you can um, because those are all important things to make it successful. Um, but I guess my, my, I don't even call it wisdom is that you'll never regret following your passion and, and life's life's too short. Definitely too short. Definitely too short. And you hit, you said four words that I think like better out than in, and you're talking about tears. Um, <laughs> we can go on a whole other conversation probably. And like for the men listening, like that's really, 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 really important and meaningful too. Like it's okay to get them out and not keep them in. So anyway, I thought that that was interesting. And you mentioned something else earlier too, that, you had heard from another founder, right? And you kind of echo that in, in how you live, I guess. And that's competition is a good thing. Um, so that's, that's interesting as well. Now, is there anything on that last question or any of the questions that we went through that you want to circle back to anything maybe that we missed anything that um, maybe didn't come into the conversation in terms of like mycelium and fungi, as it relates to food or materials, any, anything at all that you want to mention, any announcements, any asks, anything like that, the floor is so open for you. Sure. I guess the one thing I'd, I'd always love to just talk about and share is um, how excited I am about the, the future and potential of mycelium, not just for materials, there's food, there's bioremediation, there's things we can't even imagine. Um, people are making music from mycelium. Mycelium is responsible for forests existing. So I think, um, again, whatever happens with this startup, whether we exit as bajillionaires or, you know, we have to pivot, um, I think our passion and innovation will always be in mycelium and, and fungi because it's such a, a gift to have it on our planet that we can harness it and we can do it in ethical ways where you you don't have to, um, yeah, you don't cause any pain. You don't um, damage the earth by doing it. You don't, um, there's no effect on humans as long as you're not working with, you know, bacteria and things like that. So I think it's just super cool that it's so renewable. It gives so much without, without asking for much in return, I always say. Um, and it, it's truly circular. And it's just something that I'm really excited to see you know, even in 10 years, what, what kind of innovations will be out there. And I know there will be innovations that are, that are helping the planet. Um, and kind of a, kind of adjacent to that is I always just do my little um, moment about consumption, about how um, everyone doing their best to consciously consume is going to make such a big impact. Um, I always admire vegans um, and I, I just don't think my my ethnic backgrounds of Filipino and, and German and Austrian will will allow me to maybe go fully th there. But I do make every effort to reduce meat consumption, look at where things come, buy local. And I think if you can't make that full commitment, if you can make commitments to small things on a daily basis, um, there is a snowball effect. And everyone doing that rather than feeling it's all or nothing, I think will will get us further because I think some people I meet, they're like, oh, well, if I can't do it, I'm not making any difference. But I think um, every little um, 
effort just contributes to the to the bigger push to to consume less. That's just what we need to do. We just need to buy less. Brands need to make less. We need to buy less. And um, we need to really reduce, reuse, recycle. Basic concepts that we learned from a long time ago. But um, I think I've definitely seen a new meaning and what that what that truly means and what the impact of that is going forward. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, mycelium, absolutely fascinating as its own kingdom and essentially its own intelligence. It's like, so, it's, so a spark. It's, it's, it's kind of scary. Yeah. I always say we worship at the altar of the fungi. So when they take over, they know we are loyal, loyal subjects. <laughs> the fun guys. That's funny, funny. All right, folks. Well, you can find out more online, www.myceliumofthefuture.com. Mycelium, if you don't know how to spell it, M-Y-C-E-L-I-U-M, myceliumofthefuture.com. And it's the, it's easy to remember on Instagram. It's the same at mycelium of the future. So this has been another great conversation with another great entrepreneur, the co-founder of Myco Futures, Stephanie Lip. Thank you so much for joining us today. And everybody who took some time out to listen to this conversation today, we're pleased to have your listening ship and viewership here at Veg Networking Canada. And we'll catch you soon on another episode. For now, take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure.